Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to open the first uh, plenary of the forum, titled quite provocatively European Security. Can we, can we stop further confrontation? Question mark. Um, we also have a very esteemed collection of speakers, whom I will introduce very brief, briefly later. Um, I am um, Yelena Karistilova. I'm Professor of International Politics and General Manager of European Politics, uh, University of Kent. But most importantly, I'm the principal investigator of this exciting project, COMPASS, strategic partner of the Minsk Dialogue Forum. COMPASS, uh, the project sponsored by Global Challenges uh, Research Fund of the uh, Research Council's United Kingdom. Uh, aiming to develop capacity, but also explore options for resilience, which is my favorite concept, and also global governance, good governance, as to how we can work together. So here I am, uh, moderating this wonderful panel. Um, if I may perhaps um, add also a few words uh, to put this forthcoming discussion into a um, context. A lot of thinkers today are pondering, um, in fact, um, concluding that we are living in an increasingly VUCA world. The world of increasing vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, um, which was reflected in the 2016 Global Security Strategy that was already mentioned today but in slightly different form, that we live in increasingly complex, contested, and uh, connected world. So the logic then would be to suggest, that in terms of a sense of survival, for us all to get together, work together towards further cooperation, to ensure that the future, which is just around the corner, actually is far more cooperative, and with a bit of semblance of control when we work together. But instead, what we observe today actually is increasing fragmentation, um, also uh, rising nationalism, perhaps false pat patriotism uh, in some parts of the world, but also util uh, unilateral action that often challenges uh, um, security equilibrium. So, the panel today, uh, I, I, I hope, will address this very important question. Not so much, can we stop further confrontation? I'm, um, in this sense, I'm very much a believer that we can. I would like to pose a question as to how we can stop the confrontation, and um, that's what I think we should focus on today at this very important first plenary session that will set the foundation for our further constructive discussion uh, in the next two days of the forum. So, we have uh, six speakers, um, six, six distinguished uh, guests, and I believe we will perhaps uh, proceed with uh, the order mentioned in the program. So we will begin perhaps with Vyacheslav Nikolov, Chairman, Committee on Education and Science, State Duma of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation. Welcome, then we'll proceed with Dirk Wiese. Uh, sorry, I don't, yeah, so you're all sitting in the order of uh, listed here. How fantastic, thank you very much. And then we'll, uh, Dirk Wiese is a member of the Bundestag Federal Government Coordinator uh, uh, for inter-societal cooperation with Russia, Central Asia, and Eastern Partnership countries, Germany. Then we have uh, Istvan Banoch, who, will, uh, who is the State Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. And then we have Alexis um, uh, Leimek, um, Deputy Director General for Political Affairs and Security Ministry of Foreign Affairs France. Welcome. <laughs> then we also have Mr. Brett Fredden, Eastern Europe Officer Director, Department of uh, State, United States. And uh, we also have uh, Mr. Hussein Hussainov, Director of Analysis and Strategic Studies Department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Azerbaijan. So all of you, welcome. As we discussed, you will be given five, maximum seven minutes of, um, uh, to present your position. Please, please don't be fooled by appearances. Behind my smiley face, I'm a very ruthless moderator, so I will be stopping you when you exceed your time. This is just to ensure that we have it in a dialogical fashion so we can take questions from the audience in order to have our discussion going. Remember, it's Minsk Dialogue, the emphasis on dialogue. So with that in mind, I would like to invite 
uh, uh, Mr. Nikolov to perhaps to begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, though I prefer to speak the language of the majority of the audience, but we have been to на русский. Дорогие друзья, уважаемые коллеги, прежде всего хотел бы благодарить за приглашение, за прекрасное гостеприимство, которое мы здесь испытываем в городе Минске. Я всегда очень рад здесь бывать. Замечательный воздух. Каждое утро у меня есть привычка делать 10 тысяч шагов, и сегодняшние 10 тысяч шагов на берегу Свислыча были замечательными. А утки, которые там плавают, уверяю вас, самые дружелюбные утки, которых я где-либо видел на земном шаре. Это замечательное место. Но сегодня мы говорим о европейской безопасности, причем модератор просил меня поговорить об истории. Я не буду вдаваться в историю 500 лет давности, но вспомню времена после распада Советского Союза. Кстати, как называется самый большой город в Европе? Москва. Совершенно верно. Ответ правильный. Москва. Стамбул может быть немного больше, но большая его часть находится в азиатской части. После этого вам легче ответить на вопрос, какая самая большая страна в Европе. И когда в то же время в той части Европы, которая называет себя Европой, произносит слово «Европа», они не имеют в виду Россию. И в этом на самом деле очень большая проблема. Когда Советский Союз распался, возник уникальный исторический момент, когда можно было сделать абсолютно все. Можно было выстроить любую европейскую архитектуру. Горбачев говорил об общеевропейском доме. Ельцин и Козырев говорили о членстве России в Евросоюзе и НАТО. Можно было выстроить любую европейскую архитектуру. Выбор был не за Россией, выбор был за Западом. И у Запада был действительно очень серьезный исторический шанс обеспечить себе геополитические позиции, преобладающие на протяжении всего 21 века. Но тогда преобладал триумфализм. Триумфализм. Холодная война выиграна, Россия слаба, о нем можно вытирать ноги, собственно, этим сразу же и занялись. К сожалению, все предложения, которые Россия тогда выдвигала, не были приняты. Это были предложения поставить ОБСЕ в центр европейской системы. Это было отвергнуто как заговор для подрыва НАТО. Хельсинки плюс, Хельсинки 2, то же самое. Россия предлагала договор о европейской безопасности, он по-прежнему на столе. Реакция была абсолютно отрицательной. Почему? Потому что, собственно, европейской системой безопасности стала НАТО. Нас эта ситуация не устраивала по, в общем-то, достаточно понятной причине. Причина эта заключается в том, что мы не принадлежим к НАТО, мы не являемся членами НАТО. Теплые чувства... В отношении альянса, в который ты не входишь, который называет тебя своим противником и который расходует 80% всех оборонных расходов на планете, вот это чувство э, можно назвать только извращением. Поэтому никаких извращенных чувств в отношении НАТО, естественно, Россия не испытывала и не испытывала. Что получилось в итоге? Получилось, что у нас разное определение того, что является успехом в деле европейской безопасности. В деле безопасности Беларуси, Украины и так далее. Определение успеха на Западе – это как дистанцировать эти страны от России. Определение успеха со стороны России – насколько дружественны эти страны в отношении России. И это разное определение успеха предопределило вот эту очень серьезную геополитическую конфронтацию, которая привела в итоге к очень серьезному кризису на Украине и к тому, что мы сейчас имеем. Можно ли вернуться в ту точку, где мы находились в 91 году, в 92 году, еще даже в 93 году? На мой взгляд, уже нет. Поезд ушел. Стремительно, мы совершенно другой реальности. В России нет никого, к 
кто стремился бы в Евросоюз и НАТО, нам туда не надо, и нас туда не приглашают. Россия уже не считает себя страной только европейской. Россия больше, чем Европа. Она даже больше, чем Евразия. Это евро-тихоокеанская страна. Мы не можем быть периферией Европы, мы центр Евразии. Мы центр евро-тихоокеанского региона. Естественно, в евро-тихоокеанском регионе очень много партнеров. Растущие центры Сирой, Китай, Индия, на которые только две страны, приходится 60% всего мирового роста. Евросоюз, ну да, это важный геополитический игрок, но мы до сих пор не знаем ответа на тот вопрос, который задавал Генри Киссинджер. Какой номер телефона, по которому надо позвонить, чтобы выяснить позицию Европейского Союза? Баран Этешн здесь сидит. Ну, может быть, они, может быть, и существуют, но чаще всего они молчат, когда раздаются звонки из Москвы, либо они не отражают позиции всех стран Европейского Союза. И, конечно, у нас есть очень большие, большие вопросы в связи с субъектностью Европейского Союза. Насколько он суверенен в принятии своих решений. В последнее время мы видим, да, то есть проявляются некие элементы суверенности, но пока они только на начальной стадии. Поэтому, да, диалог с Евросоюзом, мы двумя руками, диалог с НАТО, пожалуйста, есть Совет России НАТО, но он не собирается. Более того, этот Совет создан для того, чтобы урегулировать конфликты, когда они возникают. Как только конфликт возникает, прекращает свою работу. Так, собственно, было в связи с конфликтом в Осетии, в связи с конфликтом на Украине. Готова ли к России к диалогу? Да, безусловно, готова. Ведет ли Россия диалог? Да, мы используем любые диалоговые площадки. Активно работает Петербургский диалог, Россия и Германия. Сейчас появился Трианонский диалог по договоренности Путина с Макроном. Сейчас развивается диалог с Австрией. Любые диалоговые форматы. Но готова ли Россия идти на какие-то там жертвы ради диалога? Безусловно, нет. Россия готова говорить на равных, что, к сожалению, не всегда получается. Россия развивает партнерские отношения. И сегодня министр иностранных дел Беларуси говорил о необходимости развития диалога не только между там, Россией и Евросоюзом, но и между Европейским Союзом и, например, Евразес. Или Шанхайской организации сотрудничества, где Беларусь наблюдатель, и в которой входит уже большинство человечества. Этот диалог исключительно важен. И возможно договариваться, я абсолютно уверен. В рамках того же Петербургского диалога мы предложили целый ряд позиций, я потом о них скажу, поскольку меня уже торопят, по которым согласятся все сидящие в этом зале. У нас есть хороший опыт того, как приходить к консенсусу. Организация БРИКС, я возглавляю российскую делегацию на академическом форуме БРИКС, возглавляю Национальный совет по исследованию проблем БРИКС. БРИКС – это 100 форматов. В конце – это общая позиция. Общая позиция пяти очень разных государств. Но каждый раз мы приходим к пониманию порядка по более чем 100 позициям. Я абсолютно уверен, что если поставить перед собой цель найти общую повестку дня, которая бы объединила всех нас, мы бы ее безусловно нашли. И к этому надо стремиться. Спасибо. And I just wonder how this brief excurs uh, in, t in history um, can help us to look into the future in terms of overcoming all these existing obstacles in having our dialogue between, between actors, especially, uh, as was noted, uh, limited actors of the EU. So the floor is yours.
Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizers of the Minsk Dialogue Forum for this uh, great event that we have here, and it's uh, great to be back in Minsk again. So uh, thank you very much for this, of course. You have the question, European security, can we stop further confrontation? I think, yes, we can. But why? I think basis for the European security is clear. It is, in my point of view, the rule-based international order which has brought especially us in Germany and large parts of Europe peace, prosperity like never before. And therefore, in my point of view, the institutional framework for security in Europe remains unchanged. It is the European Union, the Council of Europe, the OSCE and the NATO, of course. And these four institutions have succeeded in providing peace, security and stability over decades. But we have also seen, and to be very open, that peace must not be taken for granted and Europe is still not peaceful everywhere. And I think we have to recall what has caused further confrontation and put peace and stability in Europe is also in danger. We have the unresolved conflicts in Georgia and Moldova. We have the illegal annexation of Crimea. We have the situation in eastern Ukraine. And of course, we have concerns about military build-up. And we have to underscore, we will not accept violation of core principles of rule-based international order, of course, such as territorial integrity and sovereignty. But let's take a look to the four institutional framework, as I mentioned. I think the European Union, uh, and in my point of view as a federal government's coordinator, especially for inter-societal cooperation with Russia, Central Asia, and the Eastern Partnership countries, I firmly believe in the power of civil society and in people-to-people -people contacts. And that is what we also saw in the past years of the Eastern Partnership. We had a big conference there in Berlin where we see a lot of success in this project of the Eastern Partnership. And we will also see very good ideas, project especially for the youth, economic development, and especially, of course, for um, good governance, of course, in the next, also in the next years in the Eastern, Eastern Partnership programs. But um, to be open, these people-to-people -people contacts, they foster mutual understanding, of course, and maintain or rebuild trust, of course, between civil societies. And they can pave the way for more trustful political relations also in the future. And to give you one example, our German program, expanding cooperation with civil society in the Eastern Partnership countries and Russia supports people and organizations that work with groups affected by territorial conflicts. And that is something what we have to think about also from a European perspective in the next upcoming 10 years for the European, uh, for the program of the Eastern Partnership. We think that we should have more interactions, of course, with the younger generation from Russia, the younger generation from Belarus, the younger generation from Ukraine and the other Eastern Partnership countries. And that is something that we are doing actually now in our German programs where we have a very um, a good programs, a very good success. And in my point of view, that encourages them, the younger generation especially, to understand the other point of view and to develop a willingness to say this, to compromise from this understanding. And my favorite project, what I see in my daily work, is really that we have a lot of from a German perspective, a lot of cross-border projects involving, for instance, young people from Russia, Belarus, in Ukraine for have cultural projects, society projects. And that is something what is very important. And uh, let me say, um, as my colleague mentioned, the Petersburg Dialogue, we have also to think about strengthen the idea of visa liberalization, visa facilitation agreement, because if we have an exchange of the younger generation, this is, of course, difficult at the moment, and it was good that the Petersburg Dialogue, especially in this year in Königswinter and Bonn, we had a resolution about visa liberalization for the younger generation, also between Russia and the European Union, and we have to think about these, of course. The other point, of course, is the NATO, and in my point of view, the NATO is still the backbone of um, German security and defense, it preserves the Euro-Atlantic security and is, of course, very, very important for us, of course. And we believe that especially the dialogue on security policy issues, of, especially between NATO and Russia, is very important, especially in times of increasing tension. And that is why Germany has repeatedly called for the NATO-Russia Council to be convened, and that is still something that will be put on the table. To take a look to the Council of Europe, I think the Council of Europe remains central in promoting common pan-European values and standards. 
Its unique convention system and its monitoring institutions provide valuable guidance to all 47 member states, namely on human rights and the rule of law. And active cooperation of all member contributes to stability and security, especially in the wider European area from Lisbon to Vladivostok. And it is good to have to put it on the table as we do it um, also from a German perspective that we have the idea still on the table from Lisbon to Vladivostok, an economic room to think about this and uh, that is something also our Belarusian colleagues are very supportive of it and I think that is a very good idea for the upcoming future. And therefore, in my point of view, we welcome the recent return from the Russian delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. From the German perspective, we are very supportive also with my colleagues in German Parliament who are members in the Parliamentary Assembly in the Council of Europe, of course. To take a look, finalize, to take a look to the OSZE, I think the OSZE's prevention is a core issue uh, of the daily work. It provides um, today a framework for the design and implementation of practical multi-track efforts that connect regional, national and local platforms, of course, for peace. And um, I think that the OSZE actually in the, in the conflicts that we face today, the OSZE is um, actually in their three dimensions and, and very important work uh, also in the situations that we have in the East Ukraine, of course. In 2016, to say this at the end, I think the OSZE structured dialogue, uh, to remember, was launched by then German OSZE chairmanship and has developed into an important forum also to discuss security, pol security policies, and a lot of them we are discussing in the next two days on these conference. I think this can contribute to preserving constructive dialogue on our common European security and to easing existing political confrontation, of course. But however, we should also note the link between human rights and security. The guarantee of human rights and fundamental freedoms as well as strong civil society are the cornerstone of security and stability and I think the OSCE is actively contributing to this comprehensive security concept. At the end, to sum up, let me please um, take a look to the actual situation um, that we face in the, in the Minsk process, of course, because as I said, I think we have um, at the moment, we have seen some bold initiatives by the new Ukrainian President Zelensky, for whom peace in eastern Ukraine is the top priority. And we finally reached agreement on the Steinmeier formula and on next steps in this engagement. And this, I think, this opens the door to a, to a next summit and further progress also in the implementing of the Minsk agreement and um, on the way to find a solution. So, to sum up, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Visa. I was particularly pleased to hear that you emphasized the point of people-to-people -people contact, and I think what we are doing here, younger generation, I think the Minsk dialogue is doing a really good job in that sense, implementing your ideas into practice. Uh, but the question of rule-based international order, I think, is particularly important, especially that the idea of rule-based international order is now being challenged not only externally, uh, through the rise of many other uh, rule-based uh, uh, possible orders, but also um, internally. So I just wonder um, how and in what way we can actually work with this rule-based international order to make it applicable and relevant to all. Uh, I'll pass the floor then to Mr. Balach, please. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, allow me to also begin by uh, thanking the organizers of this conference for the kind invitation. I think this is a very important uh, uh, forum. Um, I think Minsk is the uh, ideal place uh, to have such kind of uh, uh, discussions, and uh, I've been very much looking forward to um, uh, today's uh, remarks. Uh, now, of course, the question we have at hand is, uh, can we stop further confrontation when it comes to European security? Um, my short response would also be yes. Uh, and before I elaborate uh, on how we do that, please allow me to uh, convey my statement uh, focusing on five key areas that I think have um, a, a profound impact on European uh, security as of today. Number one, uh, which I think is the key factor, is the changed security environment since uh, 2014. Uh, we have instability coming from the east, we have instability um, coming from 
um, the South. Number two, we have uncertainties regarding a number of security threats, both conventional and unconventional. In the more conventional arena, which is arms control disarmament, uh, we clearly have problems uh, with conventional arms control in Europe. Um, but we are seeing the demise of the INF, which we very much uh, regret. And it is our firm uh, conviction that we must not let this uh, process uh, also have an impact on uh, the negotiations regarding the START III um, agreement. Uh, and in the non-conventional uh, arena, we have terrorism, illegal migration, and also energy security, which I think is, uh, it also cuts to the heart of the problems we are experiencing uh, with security issues in Europe. Number three, um, it's not a security question per se, but it is very important because, again, it cuts to the heart of our well-being and, and uh, prosperity uh, in Eurasia, which is uh, trade and economy, especially the tensions between China and the United States. And we've recently also had some tensions between the European Union and the United States, although the tone is much more um, constructive over there, uh, fortunately. We're also closely following um, the de developments and the statistics of the German economy, uh, which does have clearly very important implications on the whole of the economy uh, of, of the entire uh, European continent, and as such, on the global economy as well. Uh, coming from a small Central Eastern European open economy, uh, and one that is clearly export driven. Our growth is very much defined by the opportunities that we are seeing in the field of exports and imports. That is something that we are closely uh, watching, obviously. And also, uh, when it comes to the European security situation, we've been experiencing for the past couple of months an institutional transition within Europe, which is to do with the ending of the institutional cycle within the European Union and the beginning of the new one. Um, uh, which is, of course, a good thing in itself, but it is also taking away much needed energy and focus from some of the more strategic um, challenges. For example, uh, there are uh, also um, very important questions that need to be tackled when it comes to uh, questions that are very much independent from the um, transition related to the institutional cycle, which is Brexit. Uh, again, we've, we've never had a situation where uh, we've been dealing with the perspective of uh, the, the decreasing of, the potential decreasing of the members of the European Union, which is why we keep saying that the European Union needs to be enlarged. Western Balkan uh, countries are, are good candidates. It is a success story that we also need. It would also have a positive impact. Uh, on uh, economies in, in Europe. Um, also, uh, Hungary has, uh, as you may know, we, has high hopes about getting the portfolio responsible for uh, enlargement and neighborhood, uh, including the Eastern Partnership. Uh, we'd uh, very much like that to happen, and we believe that it would have a very positive impact on those um, portfolios. Um, we do believe that when it comes to the institutional uh, cycle issues and the transition period, we need to have a less political um, European Commission that focuses more on specific problems, specific challenges, and specific issues. And when you look at the wider context and step back a little bit uh, and, and uh, define European security in a very extensive manner, I think you also need to tackle uh, issues such as um, the instability in Libya, instability in Syria, uh, and, the, and the wider Middle East, those clearly have an impact on European security, uh, and we must be focusing on that. We need to tackle the root causes uh, because it does have an influence on um, the issue of migration pressures and illegal migration that influences clearly uh, security um, in Europe. Now, how do we go on about tackling these factors, these five factors? Clearly, when it comes to instability in the East, um, uh, we clearly support the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. We also 
uh, wish to highlight the fact that we are expecting uh, reforms to go on. Uh, we are closely watching developments related to acquired rights of national minorities, which is very important to Hungary. And in this sense, some of the statements made by the new leadership is quite encouraging. However, um, specific measures and steps are still yet to be seen. Minsk agreements, it's the only game in town. It needs to be implemented uh, all, by all parties to the conflict. I want to emphasize that. S there are some signals that, um, that there could be a positive trend looming, uh, such as uh, uh, that is marked by the prisoner swap deal um, and developments regarding the Steinmeier formula. Maybe we should use that momentum in order to achieve further uh, positive results. Uh, when it comes to um, stability in the East, uh, we need to talk about the role of the Russian Federation. Of course, we subscribe to the general approach by um, NATO, which is to say that um, we want to invest into strengthening ourselves, but then again, we want to leave the door open for political dialogue, because we think that it is inevitable to have discussions and dialogue with Russia, because it's a key player and also important for tackling regional conflicts. Um, when it comes to the South, illegal migration and terrorism, which we believe are related, they are interlinked to a certain extent. So we need to have a sound solution for this within the European Union that is based on tackling the root causes, um, protecting borders, and not uh, basing our policies on flawed initiatives such as the relocation scheme, uh, which uh, we will not be able to uh, accept, along with many other European Union um, member states. Um, come to the concluding I'm point? just going to need about one or two more minutes. Um, one, uh, furthermore, uh, furthermore, when it comes to conventional um, issues, I've spoken about the INF. Um, as a Central Eastern European country, again, we're very much worried about this. We still keep saying that substantial dialogue is the only way out of this. We understand that maybe we're, that's not the direction we are headed towards, but we still need to be considering the possibility of that because that is the only um, way out. Energy security. Um, we're trying to work together uh, closely with our allies in order to diversify our sources, um, uh, and we'll be working on that uh, because whatever we do cannot uh, lead to a stable Europe if we do not have a diversification of, of resources. Um, finally, um, let me be this my closing message. Um, uh, when you look at the region in Central Eastern Europe, and to a certain extent, of course, um, um, uh, Belarus is, is, uh, is part of this region. Um, whenever we had a confrontation between East and West, and whenever we have not had dialogue and negotiations, this region in between Central and Eastern Europe has always suffered the consequences. So we want to see talks and negotiations and not confrontation because the alternative is something that cannot work out well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Balak. Um, so the key take is here, of course, the EU itself perhaps would need some institutional adjustment, including less political commission, but also in terms of kind of looking outwards. I mean, there are a number of opportunities there, including, of course, enlargement. Thank you. Now we are moving to Mr. Lamek. Could you please then also um, sort of outline what kind of possible solutions to the existing confrontation can we take? Thank you. Thank you. I too want to start by thanking the organizers and by thanking you for doing the moderation of this meeting. I must say that without you, probably the gender balance of this uh, panel <laughs> would be probably a little bit less balanced, yes. even more than balanced. Now, let me say just a, a few words indeed about the way we in France approach this question of, um, of uh, what well, the necessity to stop confrontation um, in, um, in Europe. It's true that um, we've been living for a long time in Europe with, a, with um, frozen conflicts, but uh, since 2014 we've seen a, a new forms of confrontation. Of course, Ukraine come to everybody, everybody's mind, but we have also the outer space, uh, the cyberspace, the fact that chemical weapons have been used for the first time in our countries, or uh, also the, 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 
new form of political interferences uh, in uh, electoral processes. Uh, and in the meantime, confidence building mechanisms and, um, and arms control mechanisms have also uh, become less effective. So yes, we have an issue, we have a problem, and we need to, to find ways of, of fixing that. At this stage, maybe uh, let me uh, say a few words about the, the current instruments that we have in Europe, uh, on which um, our um, collective, I would say, um, our security uh, relies on. We have basically three types of, uh, of inst internal instruments. By internal, I mean uh, centered inst instruments which are centered on, uh, on EU and uh, transatlantic partners. We have uh, bilateral uh, agreements between, uh, among us. We have, of course, the EU and its action in the field of security and defense. And uh, needless to say, we have uh, NATO, as, as uh, Mr. Bize rightfully so um, emphasized, which is the bedrock of collective defense and American commitment to, to Europe. Well, um, we have been trying uh, to work, uh, to, to, to improve uh, these instruments in three ways. Uh, President Macron has uh, consistently advocated for Europeans to take a greater responsibility in their own security and act uh, autonomously where and when necessary. This implies to foster our European strategic culture and um, it is the starting point in our view for the development of a European sovereignty. This is one, one uh, of course, important uh, uh, acts, I would say, on which we're working on. Also, more specifically, within the EU, um, a number of initiatives have been taken with our full support um, in order to develop, uh, and they're going to develop under the next uh, European uh, Commission. And we can come back to that in the discussion later if you want. Um, and, um, and also, I would like to mention also a few initiatives which are taken out of the EU, which, but which are also pretty promising, such as the European Intervention Initiative, um, which will allow the 12 states, now party to it, to, um, uh, to, uh, to bring closer our strategic culture. All these, all these initiatives uh, complement NATO. They concur to the same goal, and I want to, uh, to emphasize this point, because more capable EU member states and a more strategic, I would say a, a more geostrategic EU uh, will enhance NATO as a whole. So these, instru these internal instruments uh, are not the only ones our security depends on and other aspects have also to be taken into account, such as the multilateral arms control and stability mechanisms uh, on the European continent, which are mostly uh, um, addressed within the OSC and of course bilateral treaties with European implications uh, such as the INF or, or the new, or new START. Now, in spite of uh, this diversity of instruments that I just uh, evoked, um, the European stability mechanisms and the arms control regime are not as effective today as they were in the past. To some extent, uh, they, they have lost steam because um, the, um, the arms control regime was built during the Cold War to address the specific situation of the Cold War, but obviously faces difficulty today to deal with the new geostrategic era, which can be characterized by a multipolarity of actors, by the deliberate overlap of conventional and nuclear capable systems, and uh, almost unchecked competition in new domains. I would like to add also that uh, these mechanisms have been also undermined by the fact that some states have taken active steps to dismantle the existing regime. Russia's action in Ukraine in 2014 was just a culmination of other worrying trends, including with regard to the Treaty on Conventional Forces in Europe or the Vienna Documents. So, how do we address the external dimension of our security then? Clearly, in our view, we need to redefine a common stability framework that tackles these challenges. And the first of these challenges, in our view, is to restore dialogue and trust on our continent. And I think it's a point which has been raised by all the previous speakers. This issue is clearly um, at the core of uh, President Macron's approach to Russia. And I want to detail that a little bit more. First, let me be clear. Our position on the illegal annexation of the Crimea have not changed. Um, nor have they on Russia's responsibility in the triggering of the conflict in Ukraine. Our positions are well known on chemical attacks or interference practices. Interference practices. They are the basis of a policy of sanctions by the EU and it led to the adaptation of NATO's posture. Yet, we cannot be satisfied with the current situation. The quality of our dialogue with Russia, which is a necessary counterpart to the firmer approach that we have adopted since 2014, is inadequate. There is an increasing distrust, while frozen conflicts continue to threaten the, our, the stability of our continent, 
and Europe is once again becoming the scene of a strategic struggle between powers. This is the reason why we have proposed to Russia a trust and security agenda with five dimensions. Bilateral cooperation on national security, bilateral deconfliction mechanisms, a, a strategic stability agenda, uh, basically tackling conventional and nuclear aspects of arms control, well, essentially how we live in a post-INF world. Uh, also, the, the human dimension, which is a, a core dimension of um, our common security. Uh, I was planning here to speak about the, the Council of Europe, but Mr. Visa did so, and can come back maybe later in the discussion. And finally, uh, we have proposed to, to Russia also a dialogue on the international crisis. Um, in doing so, our intention is that this dialogue should foster a wider, a wider uh, Euro-Russian uh, agenda. There will be not one deal, but uh, the, our intention is to have a series of agreements to be found, uh, like a resolution of the open conflict in eastern Ukraine, as well as uh, protracted conflicts in Moldova, the modernization of conventional arms control, uh, the, the need to preserve uh, strategic stability, and as I said, uh, uh, the importance of addressing new aspects of security, such as cyber and space. On all these topics, uh, France is open to a concrete discussion eyes wide open, without any illusion, but with the ambition of modernizing existing instruments of stability or creating new ones when necessary. Conversely, we are expecting a, a comprehensive Russian answer to this effort. Our dialogue is a sincere and concrete endeavor, but also a reasoned driven one. We're not asking for sacrifices, uh, Chairman Nikonov, I want to reassure you, but um, we need meaningful Russian commitment to provide for security uh, on the continent and the visit of President Macron to Russia next year will be an important step in this regard. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamek. Uh, we are moving on now to the Director from um, 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 United States, Eastern Europe Officer Director, uh, Department of State. Please, um, what would be your take on how we can overcome the existing confrontation and what we can, mechanisms and instruments we might have in play for that? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pro uh, Professor Korsdelova, for uh, being such a, a, um, uh, a strict but um, kind minor moderator. Uh, I'm very pleased and, and humbled to be part of this, uh, this panel today. And I want to thank our Belarusian hosts for their warm hospitality and for starting and continuing this tradition of this important dialogue. For, for me as an American, it's a very exciting time. Uh, to be in Minsk, uh, as you know, uh, our Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs was just here, and we've agreed to uh, exchange ambassadors as the next step toward normalizing and, and deepening our bilateral relationship with, uh, with Belarus. Um, I want to reiterate what, um, what Ambassador Hale said when he was here last week, which is, excuse me, last month. We look forward to, to deepening our relations with Belarus in areas where our interests coincide. So among those interests are non-proliferation, border security, trade, investment, energy, um, all areas where, where we have mutual interests and where we feel we can work together. Um, it's, it is uh, another thing I think that's important to emphasize that um, Ambassador Hale said was nobody's asking Belarus to choose between East and West. Um, you know, we, we want to have a normal relationship with Belarus, um, but we understand that, that um, you know, by virtue of geography, by virtue of history and economic uh, relations, Belarus will always have a special relationship with its, with its large neighbor to the east, and that, um, uh, I want, that is not the, the purpose of our um, normalization of our relations, it's, it's not to change that. Um, it's really an exciting time, not just to be in Belarus, but in uh, the entire region. I also uh, cover uh, Moldova and Ukraine. Uh, we see in Moldova there's a broad new coalition government that has the opportunity to enact uh, real reforms and to strengthen the government institutions in, in that country, uh, to root out corruption and to, to build a more prosperous and democratic future for the Moldovan people. Prime Minister Sandu met with Vice President Pence in Washington last month, and we're looking forward to building on that momentum uh, and continuing that dialogue with, 
with the uh, new government in Moldova. Uh, in Ukraine, we've seen peaceful and competitive presidential and parliamentary elections, resulting in the outcomes reflecting the will of the Ukrainian people. We see a lot of new and energetic faces in the, in, in the government and the parliament of Ukraine, in the Rada. Um, and we welcome the Zelensky administration's stated plans to implement a broad range of, of uh, economic and um, uh, judicial and governance reforms. We believe it creates in uh, this this time uh, with the with the new Ukrainian president and the political momentum creates a window of opportunity for Ukraine to advance the vision of a prosperous and democratic future for its citizens. However, uh, it is difficult to talk about Ukraine without touching on the conflicts that continue to this day. Uh, more than five years have passed since Russia occupied Crimea and instigated a conflict in eastern Ukraine. At least 13,000 people have died in a conflict that was manufactured by the Russian government using Russian proxies that it arms, trains, leads, and fights alongside. The fact remains that Russia could end that conflict tomorrow if it wanted to. We want to see a Russia that respects the sovereignty of its neighbors. And even as, as we have imposed penalties for Russian aggression and pushback against Russia's dangerous and destabilizing actions, including interference in our own democratic processes, we have been clear that the door to dialogue is open should Russia choose to step through that door. Secretary Pompeo said recently the United States is hopeful that we can put our relationship with Russia back on a better footing, but the onus is on Russia to change course from a pattern of destabilizing activity. Turning um, to the broader question of the European security architecture as, as seen from Washington, um, we often view Europe through the, through the lenses of the EU, the OSCE, and NATO. Um, the EU is a tremendous partner for the United States in, in a variety of endeavors all around the world. And though you know, we, we see um, areas of disagreement in trade that have ex existed uh, for decades, that um, the, the, the areas where the EU and the United States work together on common interests are far greater than the areas where we, where we disagree. Uh, the OSCE, as a, as a vehicle, particularly the human dimension and its support for uh, democratic processes, uh, we believe is also a critical part of the European security architecture. Um, NATO, which uh, of course we are one of the founding members of, uh, celebrated its 70th anniversary this year. And uh, going back in, uh, in history a little, the, um, you know, after the devastation of the two world wars, um, our predecessors on both sides of the Atlantic saw that the perils and risks to each of our nations, and they understood that only an alliance could we guarantee our continued security. And, you know, it's, it's um, easy to forget today that, that what a visionary choice that was for political leaders of that period. And it required investment uh, at a time when, when investment was in very short supply. Uh, and each of those countries, each of the early members of NATO faced competing political and economic <laughs> priorities. They wouldn't know it at the time, but their decision laid the foundation for 70 years of relative peace, prosperity, and human development on both sides of the Atlantic. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago, new democracies sought to share in these benefits. This was not NATO uh, um, seeking new members. This was new members coming to NATO because they believed that was their sovereign right and that it was in their national interest to do so. Um, if we fast forward to the present, and, and um, we'll be closing in just a moment, uh, NATO reminds, it remains a defensive alliance of democratic countries aimed at promoting peace and stability in Europe. We still face a number of uh, new and emerging threats. Transnational terrorism threatens all of our citizens. Iran and North Korea combine hostile intent with access to or intent to acquire nuclear weapons. There's no reason, nevertheless, that there's no reason to believe we cannot face these challenges. Um, but we certainly cannot be complacent. We cannot simply assume our successful past as a prologue to a successful future. And I think that's one of the themes that, that, um, that this conference is, is, 
is founded upon, is looking at. Um, as these challenges accelerate, our efforts to meet them must also keep pace. And um, I think that by investing now in, in peace and security and creating uh, the, the structures, we will lay the groundwork for successors to enjoy um, peace and prosperity for uh, coming generations. So thank you for letting me speak today and thank you for letting me be on this panel. I appreciate uh, your, your attention and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Frieden. Uh, we swiftly move on to uh, Mr. Hussainov uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan. So no more than five minutes, please, because uh, we need to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, first, I would like also to join two uh, words of uh, gratitude to the organizers of the forum for this opportunity to come together with high-level officials and prominent experts to discuss uh, a wide range of issues related to uh, actual security problems uh, of our contemporary world policy. Uh, the realities of current international relations call us to recognize the vital importance of multilateral system based on norms and principles of international law for better addressing the multifaceted and interconnected threats and challenges. We all need an efficient collective security system pursuant to the purposes and principles of the UN Charter as well as Helsinki Final Act. Today, more than even before, joint and result-oriented actions are required to properly address the major risks and challenges that affect the international legal order and undermine the national unity and security of states. Ongoing political processes are testifying that we are still experiencing a period of dramatic changes, which in many instances challenges, challenge the fundamental uh, base of global order by threatening the national sovereignty of states. Irrespective of any global tendencies, the integrity and sovereignty of states are the core elements of world order must continue to constitute the linchpin of the international legal system. Rules and limitations of the Cold War period are long ago, and states, entities, and individuals with access to destructive weapons are now increasingly resorting to force and posing significant impediment to establishing a world system based on justice, rule, and tolerance. Conflicts arising from separatist movements seeking to break a part of the territory away from the state to become an independent entity or to be incorporated, incorporated into another state represent the most challenging cases. Then received ambiguously by the international community, secessionist separatist claims tend to escalate to large-scale military actions rather quickly at times attract external intervention and inevitably led to disastrous human rights and international humanitarian violations. Attempts to impose the dubious notion of constructive ambiguity encourage impunity rather than justice and definitely should be rejected as a tool in conflict settlement process. On the contrary, we should unite our efforts to expose the malignancy and the eventual failure of disintegration and separatism and denounce ethnic cleansing, the use of force, the ter territorial Caesar as flagrantly opposing principles of rule of, law, rule of law and ideals of peace. Long-standing conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh region of, of the Republic of Azerbaijan as well as the conflicts in Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova are among the major threats and challenges to peace and security in Europe. The international community is firm in its principal position that all these conflicts should be solved on the basis of respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity and inviolability of international borders of states. Azerbaijan considers regional cooperation as an indispensable element for enhancing peace and stability. Interested in creating favorable conditions for peace, security and progress in the region, my country attached great significance to the development of comprehensive partnership relations with its near and extended neighbors. However, the conflict with neighboring Armenia presents the biggest deterrent and main obstacle to the full-fledged regional cooperation. The cooperation with that country is impossible until the consequences of its military occupation of internationally recognized territories of Azerbaijan are still are not eliminated. 
Azerbaijan is committed to expanding the Trans-Caspian partnership and cooperation with the purpose of contribution to the resolution of regional conflicts, counteraction against security threats and risks, development of transport and energy communication links, and building a gateway between Asia and Europe. The ultimate goal of this overall strategy is to ensure the security, prosperity, and sustainable development of the wider Black Sea-Caspian region. It's evident that re regional security challenges emerge predominantly from certain geopolitical circumstances and specific security environment, while important steps have been made in a number of situations to address effectively the most serious international crimes. Populations around the world are still suffering from the failure of individual states in fulfilling their most basic and compelling responsibilities and the collective inadequacies of international institutions. Regrettably, the conspicuous silence and indifference, in particular to cases of military aggression and foreign occupation, serve to accentuate a deficiency characteristic of the international community today, the gap between theoretical values of law and harsh reality. With bitter truth represent a profound challenge to international stability and prosperity. Therefore, more should be done to sharpen the tools for uh, ending impunity, which is essential for durable peace and justice. The principle of multilateralism remains the most effective tool for ensuring international peace and security by way of collective decision making and taking action in accordance with international law and should be therefore upheld and strengthened. We realize that the security of every state in the world can be better promoted and ensured within a multilateral security system. This par paradigm was the principal reason behind the creation of the collective security system with the UN at its core. But after 75 years since the UN was founded, the question of is the contemporary international security architecture effectively and timely addressing the threats and risks challenging the world still remains valid. The global character of today's threats and challenges makes geographic distance irrelevant in security policy formulation since threats, as we know today, transcend national frontiers and whole continents. I'm sorry, could you please go to conclusion? Sure. The security of the state and more broadly of international uh, system will depend on whether states follow the norms and principles of international law and use them as a guiding tool for shaping their foreign and security policies. Following common set of norms and rules of the international arena contributes to transparency and predictability of state behavior and hence consolidates international peace and security. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the distinguished speakers. Now I'm uh, going to use my strategic advantage as the chairwoman over this wonderful uh, uh, intellectual uh, collection of our distinguished speakers, but also as an, acad as, as an academic. And here, if I were to be blunt in my summary of your positions, basically what gentlemen, what you've suggested is that our existing institutions of um, international order perhaps are sufficient enough uh, for us to work with them and to move forward towards overcoming the, uh, the, the existing and potential confrontations, but also what you've suggested that perhaps bilateral relations could be just enough in terms of moving forward. I don't believe that. So I would like to challenge you a bit more in terms of being creative and being a bit more open in, in this Minsk dialogue. The key word is dialogue. So how can we work together to perhaps in this uh, world of increasing uncertainty and the world that uh, European security strategy emphasized is that we are no longer in control. We need to speak to each other. How do we do it? Uh, and also, where is resilience in all of that? How do we give more opportunity to enable local communities to respond to the challenges of, uh, of the current times? And through that diversity, how then we can change, create, enhance our rule-based order so that we know and understand, understand the rules of the game and perhaps the need for change in also global architecture, security architecture. So I'll open the floor. If you have any remarks to add, yep. And then I'll open the floor to the audience. Please, who would like to go first in terms of responding to all these questions? Interesting question. We, as on the last week, there was a Valdaic forum 
многие принимали участие, в том числе и здесь присутствующих, был президент Азербайджана. И как раз, в общем-то, тема, правда, была Азия, слово Европа, вот за четыре дня практически не было не произнесено, но общий вывод о современной международной системе это то, что сейчас разрушается вот вообще то, что называется мировым порядком. То есть все институты, которые здесь в том числе называются, они либо не работают, либо работают в интересах какой-то группы стран, а все договоренности, соглашения становятся абсолютно эфемерными. Они нарушаются. Здесь много было сказано со стороны почти всех участников о том, какую зловещую роль играет Россия в современном мире, насколько она является дестабилизирующим фактором, насколько она подрывает всю европейскую и мировую безопасность. Ну, коль скоро об этом речь зашла, я тоже несколько слов скажу на эту тему. Не Россия 20 лет ведет войну в Афганистане, где погибло уже сотни тысяч людей. Не Россия являлась причиной смерти больше миллиона жителей Ирака. Сейчас там происходит тоже событие, которое вызвано большой дестабилизацией Большого Ближнего Востока. Не Россия превратила такую страну, как Ливию, первоклассную страну, в поле просто битв разбойничных группировок. Не Россия вышла из договора по ПРО, не Россия разрушила договор РСМД, не Россия разрушила договор по обычным вооруженным силам Европы, не Россия не ратифицировала договор о всеобщем запрещении ядерных испытаний. Не Россия сняла свою подпись под соглашением, которое было достигнуто в Киеве по транзиту власти, что привело к началу процесса гражданской войны на Украине. Причем еще подписи не успели высохнуть на следующий день. Эти подписи были сняты. Не Россия вышла из Парижского соглашения по климату, напротив России собирается участвовать в этом соглашении. Мы приступили к ратификации. Не Россия имеет порядка 150 военных баз на границах Соединенных Штатов Америки. У России нет ни одной базы в западном полушарии. Не Россия имеет базы в 130 странах. Не Россия меняет режимы в десятках государств. Поэтому вопрос о том, там, поиска виновных, мы можем искать очень долго. Когда мы говорим о суверенитете народном, когда мы говорим о демократии, нельзя забывать, что демократия – это не то, что об этом говорят там, в Вашингтоне, даже в Берлине, в Брюсселе, при всем уважении. Демократия – это воля народа, который живет на той или иной территории. С этой точки зрения я бы хотел бы обратить внимание наших западных коллег, европейских в первую очередь, на то, что в Крыму тоже живут люди. Там люди живут. Они не аннексированные, они люди, которые сделали свой вполне осознанный выбор. И если вы что-то хотите понять или сделать на Донбассе, вы должны понимать, что там тоже живут люди, у которых есть своя позиция. И с ними надо как-то говорить, пытаться это сделать. Я просто вам напомню, что на Донбассе живет больше людей, чем в Латвии, Эстонии, и Литве вместе взят. Это большой регион, там много людей. Господин Никонов, я прошу Значит, прощения, это у нас... А теперь, а, теперь по поводу... Я, я, могу, я могу говорить долго, я могу заткнуться, но вы просто скажите тогда, обозначьте временные рамки. Буквально короткий ответ на вопрос, потому что мы хотим еще активизировать нашу аудиторию. Спасибо. Um, if anyone would like to kind of briefly, please briefly respond, because we would like to take some questions from the audience, please.
Absolutely, very shortly. I want to take a look in the future because I can tell you everything what perhaps happened in the past, but we want to look uh, what is coming in the next years and what we can do to stop com for the confrontation. And there I think we have this very good institutional framework for security in Europe. I think we don't need a new institutional framework or something else. So we need the willingness to solve conflicts inside this institutional framework. And for this example, we have, of course, the European Union. We are actually, my colleague has already mentioned, we have will become a new. European Commission, but we have also new ideas for the upcoming 10 years for the, especially the program of the um, next years in the Eastern Partnership. There we have a lot of things to do, uh, the rule of law, fight against corruption, uh, strengthen economic development in the countries, use exchange, what we can do more. So we have a lot of things also in the European Union to do in the region and what we can do um, as a whole Europe. And of course the Council of Europe and the OECD, if there's a willingness of all uh, who participate in conflicts that we can find solutions for solving conflicts and then, then we say, can stop also for the confrontation and that is in my point of view the big things uh, we have to solve conflicts we don't have to establish frozen conflicts or hot conflicts we need to solve these problems and that is good to be here in Minsk to be here in this forum to get ideas for the futures and not to take a look back in the past thank you Ms. Lamik, you wanted to add something no, thank you uh, no, just to come back to your question whether we need new instruments or whether we, we we're good with those we, we have. I think we, we need to be flexible in this regard. I mean, we, and we need to work in all directions. But we should not underestimate, you know, the importance of these old uh, instruments. We need to make them work. Um, look at, for example, look for example at the question of uh, of uh, arms control. And um, you know, at this moment, we, we don't we only have new start uh, treaty um, uh, for us um, in Europe. This treaty is going to expire next year. Uh, clearly, we are much better off with, with it than without it, right? And so uh, we, we need to work to strive uh, to make sure that uh, we can ex uh, get an extension, or, uh, an extension of it. I mean, we need to, uh, to, to keep this, uh, this architecture. Second, um, when we speak about current existing mechanisms, we need also to make them work. And that's also an important um, uh, amount of energy that we have to, to devote to, to that. That does not mean that we should not uh, you know, be closed or, um, to, to any other solutions. But you know, in many cases, we don't need new rules. Look, look at cyber, for example, um, and cyberspace. Uh, well, we already have a number of, uh, of rules which exist. It's international law, including international human Italian law, and simply we, we need to make sure that this works and it is fully implemented. Not closed, as I said, to, to, the, uh, to the notion of looking at uh, exploring uh, new instruments, but already uh, let's make sure that those we have do, do, do work fully. Um, just if uh, only a brief remark. Uh, yeah, just a brief please, remark. And then we'll um, open the floor. I'll collect a few questions, please. I can only echo our colleagues who said that we do not need new uh, structures and instruments as long as modernization means a better usage of the already existing institutional structures, then it's fine with us. But I think in particular the OSCE and the Council of Europe are the appropriate uh, uh, venues uh, and, and uh, structures for political uh, dialogue. And of course we have all the other um, organizations, EU, NATO, etc. Fantastic. It's important to have a lot of confidence in the existing institutions, uh, especially that um, to see where we are today in terms of looking into the future. But we need to look into the future, which is less certain and less controllable than it is today. I'd like to open the floor uh, to our to the questions from the audience. Please, when you have a question, briefly, very briefly introduce yourself and briefly ask your question. I'll collect about three or four and then we'll uh, uh, have, have an answer. Thank you, please. I'd like to address the question to the moderator. Having listened uh, with respect to all the distinguished speakers, what would be your final answer to the question of the plenary session? Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you. We'll collect more questions. Uh, please, Artem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Artem and the others. Uh, only small question. Is there in future activities for smaller or in-between states? Because that's still coming to greater powers discussion in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Two more questions I can take, please. Дмитрий Камаков, Украина, Центр РАК. Вопрос следующий. Если мы говорим о 
повышении эффективности действующих институтов, то насколько сегодня и страны Евросоюза, и Россия, и Соединенные Штаты готовы к реформированию действующих институций, в частности Совет за безопасности ООН. Потому что на сегодняшний день сложилась ситуация, когда страна с ядерным потенциалом может вести агрессивную политику, агрессивную войну, в частности, как это делает РФ в отношении Украины, и при этом блокировать любые резолюции, касающиеся урегулирования этого конфликта в рамках этой институции. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question, please. No? Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Marcel Rötig, resident representative of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Ukraine and Belarus. My question is uh, directed to Mr. Nikonov. Um, Mr. Nikonov, uh, President Zelensky, uh, already marked the red line, even though Ukraine now generally supports the Steinmeier formula, um, Zelensky says there cannot be local elections under the presence of Russian troops and under the non-control of the Russian-Ukrainian border of Ukrainian forces. How does Russia see that? Can there be elections in Ukraine um, by the fact that uh, the border control is given back to the Ukrainian side? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we can I can invite then the speakers to respond to the questions that were addressed to them in particular, but perhaps also some of you to uh, answer some general questions, especially the question that was addressed not just to me, not to you, but also to me in terms of can we overcome the confrontation, further confrontation, but also in terms of the role of smaller states and whether we are ready to reform the existing institutions. And there was a question uh, to Mr. Nikon Nikonov in particular. So, who would like to go first? Да или нет? Я думаю, что мы не находимся на краю пропасти. Первое. По поводу реформы организации Объединенных Наций и войны против Украины. Знаете, есть такой анекдот, очень похожий на правду. Порошенко спрашивает, скажите, почему э, вы воюете на Донбассе? Он отвечает, ну, потому что там есть российские войска. А почему тогда вы не воюете в Крыму? Потому что там действительно есть российские войска. Знаете, Российское военное присутствие, вот о чем здесь говорят, да, о чем задают вопрос, это такая серьезная штука -то вообще. Российская армия это серьезная вещь. Не дай бог, если она где-то появится. И не дай бог Украине, если там появится российская армия. Для того, чтобы, понимаете, вывести войска, их сначала надо туда ввести. Я не думаю, что это вам тоже понравится. Поэтому прекращение гражданской войны на Украине это, конечно, очень важная задача важнейшая задача которую пока что украинская власть не решает единственное, что для этого надо, надо выполнять Минские соглашения там есть приблизительно 11 или 12 пунктов как вы будете считать, которые должна выполнить Украина она еще не выполнена ни одного формула Штайнмайера, о которой здесь говорили это ну, такой первый шаг Начало. To, uh, to security uh, issues, uh, to, uh, to in order for, for, for us to address uh, in the best way uh, um, uh, the situation we're dealing with. And I think you will like it. Uh, third element of this uh, initiative was also to identify issues on which uh, a new uh, institutions, new, uh, new governance structures uh, might be required. So uh, might be a scope then for, for, for that as you wish. So, uh, with, re with regard to both uh, Ukraine and, and the role of smaller countries, I think I, I want to um, respond to one thing that uh, our, our Russian colleague has said twice, that there's a civil war in Ukraine. There is no civil war in Ukraine. There is direct 
Russian aggression against its neighbor. Um, and I think one of the things that, that has to happen is that Russia has to respect the independence sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbors and the choices that those countries want to make in terms of their path towards development. Um, I think in terms of the role of smaller countries, this is a perfect example uh, of, of uh, Minsk, for example, um, was the site of the, um, obviously, of the Minsk agreements. Um, the countries like Belarus can play an important role uh, in bringing others together to, to reach agreement. Um, I would say that um, the Ukrainian side has has uh, implemented the uh, special status agreement, the special status for uh, for Donbass. The parliament has voted every year to to renew that. Um, so, uh, to this point, Ukraine is doing its part to fulfill the Minsk agreements within the context that that it can. In other words, but until it controls its own sovereign territory, there are um, certainly uh, conditions that can't be fulfilled. So. Uh, we're very pleased that, that the Steinmeier, uh, that uh, everyone has agreed on the Steinmeier formula. We, we know that to implement that and to hold free and fair elections uh, in, in Ukraine, there has to be a withdrawal of the foreign forces and disarmament of, of, the, of Russian proxies. Um, and, um, and there has to be uh, some kind of international mechanism to um, establish security in that region. And that's perhaps an area where, where Belarus could also play a role. I mean, this, here I'm just speaking personally, but one could imagine, uh, you know, Belarusian peacekeepers on the, on the Russia-Ukraine border uh, as part of an agreement. Um, I just throw that out to be a little bit provocative. It's not U.S. policy. Thank you. Um... Any more interje uh, interjections from our speakers? If not, um, no, informally, sorry. Um, on that note, uh, I, I do realize this is the first plenary session, and of course it's only the beginning of this very important dialogue that we are going to have here for the next two days. So I would like to invite uh, all those of you who still have questions